Welcome to Viking Radio Theater. My name is Walter Lutch, and I'm the production director as well as your host for this episode. If this is your first time tuning in, Viking Radio Theater is a monthly, hour-long broadcast, written, acted, and recorded by the writers, actors, and sound engineers of Western Washington University and our local community. We revitalize the genre of radio theater, utilizing the format to tell modern stories with a style that engages the imagination. You can listen to our program here on KMRE 102.3 as part of the Community Playhouse and on Western's KUGS 89.3. All of our episodes are also available anytime on our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash Viking Radio Theater. If you're interested in voice acting, script writing, or sound editing and effects, consider being a part of our show. You can get more details by sending us an email at vikingradiotheater at gmail.com. This winter, we held our second annual script contest. We'd like to thank everyone who submitted this year. Together, you gave our judges a wide variety of quality storytelling to choose from. Tonight's episode will feature each of the pieces selected as finalists for this year, as well as the second episode of our multi-part serial, Lost Souls. We'll head right into the third place finalist for this year, Nail Polish, by Matthew Page. Are you ready yet? Give me a second. I'm still doing my nails. Are you kidding? We're gonna be late. No, we aren't. Look, you're going to be unconscious through most of it. No one's going to care what your nails even look like. Just wait a second, Kay. Let me stick my hands in the fridge for a bit. Okay. Why are you looking at me like that? Nothing. Don't nothing me. What is it? Just... Why are you doing this? Doing what? You know what I mean. Because I have to. That doesn't make any sense! It's just so weird, Mark. Kyoko. My name is Kyoko. Kyoko. Sorry. I know. It'll take some getting used to. Yeah, you can say that again. Okay, this is clearly bothering you. Talk. It's just, first it was the hormones, and now this? What? What's wrong with the surgery? I fell in love with a femme boy, not a... A... A what? Trans woman. You fell in love with me. I know. And we've been together for three years now. Yeah, three years I'll never get back. Three years you'll never get back? What are you saying? Are you saying I've wasted those three years? I don't know, maybe? George, I... How could you? Don't walk away from me. Come back. I don't know what to say. Don't go. Do you remember how we first met? Of course I do. It was at Snowflake Lane. Yeah, you were the guy on stilts. I was there with my sister. Shivering like a leaf. You're such a skinny little thing. How many layers were you wearing? Twelve or something? It was only like five layers. Yeah, but despite that, you were still cold. I was only wearing jeans, remember? Yeah, like that negates all the other clothes you were wearing. True, but hey, don't give me that look, you noodle. Ugh, you were adorable that night. Dare I say you love at first sight? You say that every time. I know. But Mark was the one I fell in love with that night. Excuse me? You know, have you ever considered how this makes me feel? Yes. Yes, I have. You won't say anything. I feel like I'm prying open a nailed coffin with my bare hands. Fine. If you want to know what I think, then fine. Here's what I think. I've spent years hiding who I am because I thought my parents would hate me. I was bullied and beaten day in and day out and had slurs spit at my face. And from being beaten down from every person and everything around me for just loving other men, I learned to hate myself. I hated how I couldn't love girls like the other boys. I hated that the church my parents took me to every Sunday and how every youth group member I met at every Wednesday tell me I'd burn in hell. It took years to finally accept myself for who I am. I am George, and I am gay, and I'm proud of it. What you are doing, it's forcing me into hiding. Hiding a part of myself that I no longer want to be ashamed of. You're forcing me back into the closet. If you can't accept me for who I am, the front door is right there. I I'm sorry. I... I do love you. I shouldn't have said that. Get out! Yeah? And if I leave, who's going to drive you to the hospital and back? Well, I could... <sighs> you always do know how to think everything through, don't you? Shut up, Noodle. Look, I love you. I really do. And I'm staying with you. Got it? I love you, too. But must you do your nails? Yes, I do. I don't see why. 
The first time I wore nail polish, I was four. My sister painted my nails purple with red flowers. They made me feel beautiful. I was so proud of them. Being the naive kid I was, I showed them to my mother, and she, she hit me. Then she started screaming and told me to get out, and that she never wanted to see me again. I was so terrified, I ran out the front door. I remember that day was a Thursday, because it was one of the days my dad had visitation. It was only a few hours in the afternoon at my mother's church, so I ran there and waited for him. I expected, I don't know what I expected from him, but I thought he'd be understanding. Maybe save me. Instead, as soon as he saw my nails, he pinned me against the wall. I was too shocked to even cry. Then Pastor Richardson ran out of his house and grabbed me from my father. It was only then I started to cry, explaining to him everything that happened. He called my mother, and he talked to both my parents. Then he made me remove the nail polish, and told me never to do it again, because if I did, I would go to hell. I think we've already established your parents were insane. I know, but wearing nail polish, it gives me pride. It's a symbol to me that I've come so far. They can't stop me. They can't even hurt me anymore. I need to paint my nails to show that I can be unapologetically me, without fear. And I'm so scared right now. Come here. It's okay. Y you don't have to do this if you don't want to. But I do. I just need courage, that's all. Courage and your support. I'm sorry. I never meant... Look, I'll stick with you through thick and thin, I promise. I'm just still wrapping my head around all this. That's all. Give me time. I know. Look, we're gonna be late. Are your nails dry yet? Oh, I forgot. Let me stick them in the fridge. Okay, just don't take too long. I know. Love you. I love you too. Always. The end. That was Nail Polish by Matthew Page. George was played by Mitchell Parker, and Kyoko was played by Jade Gage. Congratulations to Matthew for winning third place in the 2016 Script Contest. Now for a quick commercial. Has this ever happened to you? I have too many emotions. I just, I can't, I can't even. Never struggle again to find the perfect combination of facial expressions to communicate your emotional state. Now from Generic Company comes an astounding new product that will change the way you emote. Introducing Face Palm. Face Palm lets you take emotional expression into your own hands, literally. Wow, how does it work? Each facepalm pack consists of 24 temporary tattoos of assorted facial expressions, ranging from anger and disgust to joy and casual indifference. Just slap these tattoos on your hands and wave goodbye to conversational confusion. Now you have three different faces to communicate with. Wow, this product is amazing! We know! Now put the excited expression on your hand and let everyone else know how you feel. Order now and receive a bonus pack of six indifferent expressions for everyday wear. Warning, face palm temporary expression tattoos may cause skin peeling, irritation, loss of limbs, loss of friends, and death. Face palm temporary tattoos. Give your face a hand. You're listening to Viking Radio Theater on KMRE 102.3. Up next is the winner of second place in our 2016 script contest. Virtual by Laura Munger. Kayla O'Connor is sitting next to a hospital bed. The woman in the bed appears to be sleeping. Kayla holds her hand. I've been thinking about you all day, Mom. I was at Michelle's graduation today. I wish you could have been there. You would have been so proud. She got up in front of everybody and made this terrific speech. She was so confident. You would have loved it. Absolutely loved it. Kayla looks down at her mother, biting her lip and blinking back tears. Dad's still not handling your... your condition very well. He's been a little crazy. But I made him promise to get back on his meds, and he says he'll drink less. God, I hope he does. Stacy and I are getting married soon. I can still hardly believe that she stayed with me even after all the awful things I said to her when... when you got sick. We're having the wedding over at Baker Park. Her family can't come, they're still living in Mars Colony. But Stacy and I are planning to go visit during our honeymoon. Dan told me he was going to visit today. He should probably be showing up soon. It'll be good to see him. He's so busy all the time now. I suppose he gets that from his mom. I remember Aunt Lydia always used to rush about, always doing something, never stopping to catch her breath. As Kayla is talking, the door slides open and a young man walks in. 
Kayla looks over and smiles. Hello, Dan. Dan pulls up a chair and sits next to Kayla. Hi, Kayla. How are you feeling? Oh, I'm all right. How are you? I'm fine. How's the new job? Good. Hectic, but good. It's been keeping me pretty busy. I'm sorry I haven't had a chance to talk to you in a while. That's okay. I understand. I've been thinking a lot lately about the old days, when we were growing up. That was a good time, wasn't it? Do you remember how we went to the park every Saturday? Yeah. And if one of our moms was on a mission, we would hold each other's hands and run through the trees, pretending we were up there in space with her. You know, Dan, sometimes I wish we'd never grown up. I wish we could have just kept running and running and never come back down to Earth. Dan doesn't say anything. He looks around the room. Pale rays of light shoot through the cracks in the blinds, illuminating the sleeping woman's face. Finally, he shakes his head and looks back at Kayla. Why do you do this, Kayla? I don't know. I guess I just need to get out of the house. Sometimes I regret moving back in with Dad. I know it helps him for me to be around, but it's tough. So sometimes I have to leave. But why come here of all places? Dan gestures at the room around them. Why put yourself through this? I have to, Dan. I don't think I could cope if I didn't. If you had just told me what was happening when she was first diagnosed, before she went into that coma, I could have given her a full neural scan then. Or you could have asked her doctors to. And then you could be talking to her right now, and she could be talking back. You could be laughing together like you used to. I couldn't do it, Dan. I'm the first to admit virtual reality has its uses. It probably has more uses than anyone ever imagined when it was first invented. But pretending to bring the dead back to life isn't one of them. It's like saying that months or even years of watching a loved one suffer never happened, never mattered. People who try to bring back loved ones at the peak of health and life, they're just lying to themselves. You're wrong, Kayla. I've seen the good that virtual reality can do for grieving families. It helps them heal, to keep happy memories alive. You would say that, wouldn't you? What is that supposed to mean? Well, that's your new job, isn't it? Researching new and better ways to make people think the dead can talk back? Says the woman who spends hours every day in a VR room. I'm a doctor, Kayla, not a monster. Yes, you are a doctor, but a fairly useless one. You didn't do anything when Mom got sick. How can you possibly do anything now? I'm sorry, Dan. I don't know why I said that. It's okay, Kayla. It's not like I haven't said the same things to myself a thousand times. But just because I couldn't help your mother doesn't mean I can't try to help you. I'm not just a doctor. I'm your cousin, and I'm your friend. And as a friend, I'm getting worried for you. You don't have to be. I'm fine. I'm good. Are you? You don't talk to anyone about what you're feeling. Not Stacy, not me, not anyone. Instead, you sit here, subjecting yourself to the most terrible part of your life. Again and again. How can we not be worried? We? And who would we be? Your family, your friends. Kayla, you're not alone. We all care about you. We're all going through the same thing right now. We're all trying to cope, to heal. I guess that's why I came today. To make you understand that you're not alone. We're here for you. Kayla doesn't reply. Dan doesn't know what else to say. After a while, Kayla breaks the silence. Dan? Yeah? If it were your mother who was dying, and if you took a neural scan, would you really be willing to make a simulation of her alive and well? Do you really think that isn't lying to yourself? <sighs> Maybe it is, Kayla. I don't know. But let's say it is a lie. How is what you're doing right now any different? You come here every day and you pretend she isn't already gone. You pretend there's still a chance. You're wrong, Dan. Doing this? How could it possibly convince me she's still here? When every time I leave, it's like she's dying again. It's like I'm killing her myself. Then why do you come here, Kayla? Kayla doesn't have an answer for that. Kayla looks at her cousin, then turns and looks at the woman in the bed. 
Her hand still rests in Kayla's own hand. It feels soft and warm. I miss you, Mom. Kayla stands up and leans over her mother, kissing her forehead. Then she straightens and steps back. Computer. End simulation. I think I'm ready to come back down to Earth. Kayla turns and walks out of the empty room, holding her cousin's hand. The end. That was Virtual by Laura Munger. Kayla was played by Julia Rutledge. Dan was played by Trent Browning. And the narrator was Adam Kane. Congratulations to Laura for winning second place in the 2016 Script Contest. Stay tuned for our grand prize winner right after this. Hello again. Remember us? It's Squarespace. After the exciting launch of our super successful online Square service, we decided to branch out. Do you get it? <laughs> Into new technological endeavors. Toothpaste. Toothpaste. If you didn't know it, toothpaste cleans your mouth rocks. We here at Squarespace care about the importance of good dental hygiene. We very much enjoy teeth. And we really want others to too. Standard tooth care products don't cater to the sophisticated needs of the discerning Square community. That's why our tooth care products feature a variety of squirrel friendly flavors. Like almond, walnut, peanut, cashew, chestnut, chocolate covered sunflower seeds, super fruit, pistachio, and introducing pumpkin, pumpkin seed, pumpkin, pumpkin spice. spice. We formulated our Squarespace toothpaste with super strong ingredients to ensure a healthy and nutty fresh mouth feel. Who needs sodium laurel sulfate and sorbitol when you can have dirt and twigs? Since squares are known for our adorably short forelimbs, some say that Squarespace toothpaste isn't a practical product. That doesn't bother us. Squarespace toothpaste, coming to a cozy woodland near you. Squarespace toothpaste, brush the stuff away. Squarespace toothpaste, try it today. You're listening to Viking Radio Theater on KMRE 102.3. It's time to present our grand prize winner for Viking Radio Theater's 2016 Script Contest. Truly the best of the best from this year. And it is The Soft Eclipse by Adam Kane. There is a wedding reception at Lake Samson Park under a looming white tent by the water. Lisa, the bride in her relatively simple gown, is sitting at an empty table under the tent, watching relatives and their children dance to I'm a Believer in a Jumbling Mass. Howard, Lisa's uncle, sits down next to her with a tired grunt. You're not going to dance, Lisa? I've already done lots of dancing. Oh, come on. Everyone's up there. Well, well, except for us old fogies. I know. What's wrong, sweetheart? You look dead. This is your big day. You should be happy, huh? Uncle Howard puts his hand on Lisa's and jostles it a bit. I know I should. Well, then what is it, sweetheart? Have you heard of the ship of Theseus problem? Well, that wasn't where I expected this conversation to go. No, I haven't. What is that? Well, I'll tell you, but I don't want to go too far into it. What, because you don't think I'll understand? No, because you look a bit drunk. Uncle Howard, with his supportive smile and eyes wide and unalert, gives a quick thumbs up. But anyways, it's this problem where you remove all these planks from a ship, one by one over time, and replace each one of them with new ones, one by one over time. The ship looks exactly the same, but with newer planks. But the problem is asking if it's the same ship anymore. It's an old paradox. It's the same ship, and it's not. You were always very smart, Lisa. <sighs> Uncle Howie, were you even listening? Oh, I was listening. I was. I was. Pluto's Ark, his ship, old philosophers walking the plank. Sure, sure. Right. Well, honey, I don't know what's going on in your head, but I'm going to encourage you to look past it. It is a bright, sunshiny day, and everyone here is here for you. And you're truly a woman now. You're married and... Don't say that. Everyone tells you you're a woman at all kinds of random parts of your life that have no bearing on anything. I was a woman before this. Maybe. Maybe I'm still not. I don't know. It feels impossible to know when we actually change. Okay, okay, sweetheart, you're getting too sad. Depressing right now. This isn't the time for it. Look, think about this Jared fellow you're marrying. He seems like a good guy, 
A little short, sure, but he isn't a twig or anything. And he's funny. You know, he came by my table earlier and he asked how I was doing. I told him I was just fine. I was glad to meet him and he said, <laughs> um, oh, what did he say? It was, it was very, very good. I, I can't remember right now, but I will tell you when I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Uncle Howie. I could almost guess anyways. I know his humor pretty well. He's always been funny. See, there you go. That's the spirit. It's not Jared that I'm worried about. I know I love Jared. Ah, well, I guess I wouldn't expect a simple problem from you. What does that mean? That's just such a usual problem you hear about for new brides. Cold feet. Doubt all that. It figures that something else is going on for you. You don't get bogged down by the simple, predictable problems. Well, this is a simple problem. It just has nothing to do with Jared. Well... No, in a way he does have something to do with it in that he's my husband, not in that he's him. You don't want to get married? No, I do. It's just... I do. Well, then what's the problem? I... well, I don't know. Maybe there isn't one. Lisa looks out toward the lake. A crowd of ducks is floating about. They dip their heads in the water, turning their whole bodies upside down, and rise back and clap their wings on their backs to shake off the water. A boy and his father ride by on their bikes. The boy stops to look at the ducks, and the dad tugs at him to hurry along. Oh, come on. Just let the kid look at the damn ducks for a minute. Uncle Howard, who is looking the other direction, turns back around. What's that now? Nothing. You're acting very funny today, Lisa. Lisa, not really listening, is still looking out at the lake. You know, I have a lot of memories of this park, now that I think of it. They do that 4th of July show here every year, don't they? Yeah. And every year the lake gets covered in smoke because of it. And over there on that bench, in junior high my friends and I would hang out around that bench right there, like a bunch of crows. At this moment, there are a bunch of crows on the bench Lisa is gesturing to. Or over there I walked with Colson a lot, my first boyfriend. And in that spot on the lake there, me and my friend Bryn from elementary school swam around and played every summer until she moved. Is all that stuff why you wanted the reception here? Partly. It's also just a really nice venue for pretty cheap. But there is something nice about being here again. It's like getting to experience a memory, rather than just have one, you know? Oh yeah. Yeah, I know. Uncle Howard, tipsy and surprised to be asked to share his thoughts, does not know. Lisa turns and sees among the crowd her husband dancing with one of his sisters. How did you and Jerry meet again? Jared and I met in a political science class. He said something to me <laughs> about first past the post being the best voting system because athletic stamina was important for a president to have. Well, it is. He's a smart man. I wish I could have taken him for a walk here, though. You still can? Why couldn't you? <sighs> I know. I still can. Lisa turns back to look at the pond. There's a Dickinson poem about marriage that I like. She calls becoming a wife a soft eclipse. Even though it made sense to me then, I think now I understand it, you know? See, you're so smart. I bet you could recite it for me. You used to do that when you were little all the time, reciting things and all. <laughs> Those were children's poems, Uncle Howie. And besides, I don't remember all of it. I used to. It's been a while since I was in school. Some part goes... How strange a girl's life looks behind this soft eclipse. I think the earth looks this way to those in heaven. I don't know. Yep, that sounds right to me. See, don't doubt yourself. Howard smiles at her. He stands up, ungracefully, and kisses her on the head and pats her on the back. I'm proud of you, Lisa. He walks in an imperfect line towards the dancing crowd. Thank you, Uncle Howard. Lisa sits for a while watching the pond. Moments later, Lisa's niece Tammy toddles over in a bright pink dress. Hey there, Tammy. What a pretty dress you have on. Hi, thank you. Immediately, Tammy walks on past out from the tent and into a mud puddle from a previous rain. Lisa watches her stomp in the mud and dance all alone, laughing. Lisa wants to join her. 
and after watching for a long moment, she gets up to do so, but she feels a tug at her arm. Come on, honey. I haven't seen you in a while. I almost forgot who I was marrying. Lisa sees Jared's warm expression on his face. She can't return the expression. As the crowd of relatives take her in, all those men and women that raised and loved and watched her, she catches one more glimpse of Tammy, all alone, ruining her pink dress and giggling in the sunlight. The end. That was The Soft Eclipse by Adam Kane. Howard was played by Walter Lutch. Lisa was played by Aubrey Daniel. Tammy was played by Julia Rutledge. Jared was played by Adam Kane. And the narrator was Delaney Rogers. Congratulations to Adam for writing an excellent piece and winning grand prize in this year's script contest. Right after the break, the second episode of our sci-fi serial, Lost Souls. Hi, I'm Marty McCarty, owner of Marty McCarty's Rental Parties. Do you find yourself in need of a party, but look through your phone book or Rolodex or whatever and find that, uh-oh, you got no friends? No problem. Just call Marty McCarty's Rental Parties, and you won't need any. Our party professionals will come to your house, decorate your home, and even pretend to like you. Use our parties to impress co-workers, family, prospective loved ones, His Holiness the Pope, your boss, your pet, your landlord, and even yourself. That's right, just call us and we'll set up a party for you when you least expect it. Choose from our large party selection. Birthday, bachelor, bachelorette, after, surprise, political, Boston tea, we have it all. Just call Marty McCarty's Rental Parties, where we'll be the friends you wish you had. Remember, if you want a party, just call Marty. Marty McCarty's Rental Parties will be the friends you wish you had. Ding! You're listening to Viking Radio Theater on KMRE 102.3. Every year, our script contest attracts some of our highest quality submissions. But we're always looking for great stories to tell. If you have a piece you'd like to submit, send us an email at vikingradiotheater at gmail.com. And now... Viking Radio Theater presents the second chapter of our multi-part serial. In the year 2057, a generational spaceship was sent into space to push the limits of human exploration. Some of the crew with advanced skills were put into cryostasis to preserve knowledge of the ship. The rest have lived and died on board, each generation changing the culture of this contained world waiting for the day when the sleepers awake. Lost Souls, starring Lauren Odie, Aubrey Dangel, and Mitchell Parker. Episode two, A Web of Secrets. Written by Laura Munger, directed by Julia Rutledge. Laura, Laura, you need to get up. We have to leave for our work shift. <sighs> what time is it? How long have I been asleep? It's 0600. You've been asleep for about eight hours. <laughs> Nothing compared to however many decades I slept the night before. I wish I knew how long I was actually in that cryo pallet. I don't suppose knowing that would make any difference right now. I guess not. Here, have a fiber pack. We have to hurry to get to work. Work? Yeah, if you're going to be hiding in the fourth ring, you have to do as the laborers do. Which is to say, labor. Exactly. Here, you can borrow some of my clothes. Yours don't quite blend in. Okay, but won't people notice a new face regardless of what I'm wearing? Are you joking? As far as the upper rings are concerned, we don't even have faces. What about the other laborers? For now, if anybody asks, we'll tell them what I told Henry yesterday. You're a laborer named Sarah who's been working in some out-of-the-way corner of the second ring. It just so happens that whoever's asking hasn't really met you yet. It's rare, but it happens. Sounds reasonable. It won't fool people for long, but that doesn't really matter. I don't think many people will be asking questions. Won't people want to know who I am? I would trust any of these people with my life, but... What they don't know they can't be forced to tell or accidentally reveal. Exactly. Come on, we have to get to the tube that leads to the third ring. There'll be guards there. They'll ask you for your work ID number. Every laborer gets one when they enter the work pool. It's the only identifier that the computers officially acknowledge. They don't even accept names. 
What do I say when they ask? Tell them that you're worker 14327. Why that one? A woman, Angela Morris, died recently. I haven't registered her death yet, so the guards still think that the number is a valid work ID. Won't someone eventually realize she's dead? I mean, it seems like it would be hard to hide the body. Well, she's probably in the best hiding place on Seoul right now. When you woke up, I put her body in your place. That's a good plan, but there's a problem with that. What? The suspension system monitors brain function and other vital signs. A dead body might stay preserved in there, but the system won't read any of the vital signs. And if somebody notices, there could be trouble. Jang. You're right, Doctor. Hopefully Seven is still working in that section. Seven? Maximilian Kramer the Seventh. He's the caretaker who was on duty when you woke up. He wants to keep this quiet just as much as we do. Look out, we're about to reach the checkpoint. How could I miss it? Those guards are wearing full-body combat suits, for goodness sake. We're guiding. 23821. 14327. Very well. Move along. Oh good, they fixed the anti-grav in this hallway. Huh. Back when the soul first left the Earth, this was astounding, cutting-edge technology. And now it's taken entirely for granted. Oh, we don't take it for granted. Not when it breaks as often as it does. So, where are we headed? Second ring. We're both on cleaning duty. You've been assigned to the aft infirmary. Just look for the blue cupboard in the back corner. That's where all the supplies are. Do you know how to get there from the third ring? It's fastest if we split up there. Of course. Where are you working? The sleeper section. Same as yesterday. I'm sorry, you can't go in. This section is temporarily restricted. What? No one is allowed inside for now. On the orders of caretaker Kyung. Why? You're not cleared to know that, I'm afraid. But I work in that section. Really? I've been assigned to work here for the next two weeks to monitor the sleepers. I can assure you that they are being well looked after in your absence. Now, if you can move along, I'm sure you'll be notified when the restriction is lifted. Fine. I wonder what's going on. What if someone realized that Dr. Williams woke up? What if they know I helped her escape? Yang, what do I do? What do I do? Okay, Max, keep calm. You just have to find out what's going on in there. Uh, there should be an access panel somewhere along here. There we go. Ooh, ah, it's dusty in here. Now I just have to squeeze in and find a ventilation grate I can look through. I can't believe there's another one. What is this, the second in three months? Yes, it seems to be happening more often now. It used to happen only once a decade or so. If it keeps going like this, there won't be any sleepers left. <coughs> Yang! What was that? It sounded like it came from the wall. Maximilian Kramer the Seventh, get out here this instant. Y yes, sir. What in the name of all the sleepers were you doing, Mr. Kramer? Eavesdropping on your superiors is a grave misconduct. Well, what is your explanation? I... I'm sorry, Caretaker Kyung. It's just, when I heard that something was happening in the sleeper section, I couldn't help but wonder if I had done something wrong yesterday. And I decided that I just had to know. I had to know if I had somehow endangered the sleepers. I'd like to have a private word with Mr. Kramer. Yes, sir. Mr. Kramer, I'm afraid I'm going to have to give you over to security to take care of. This kind of behavior is unacceptable. I don't think that's really necessary, sir. You can trust me. Really, Mr. Kramer? Why should I trust you? Just another farmer who thinks he can make it in the second ring. A caretaker is all I've ever wanted to be, sir. What about your family? I left them behind when I came here. I am a caretaker before anything else. Hmm. You truly want to be the best caretaker you can be? Oh, yes, sir. Absolutely. Keep in mind, Mr. Kramer, if I have any doubts, I will not hesitate to call security. I understand, sir. Well, then, take a good look around, Mr. Kramer. 
Is is that a corpse, sir? It is. Who is it? Dr. Laura Williams, according to the pallet she was in. You mean she's a sleeper? I'm afraid so. Soul, this is terrible. What does it mean, sir? Mean? Not much, I should think. But, sir, sleepers can't just die. It must be a sign or... or something. She's not the first sleeper to die, and I doubt she'll be the last. What? Others have died? Mr. Kramer, did anything unusual happen yesterday? Uh, I don't think so. Strange. There's usually some indication before this kind of thing happens. There were some, uh, weird electrolyte and cardiac readings from one of the pallets, but when I went and checked, there didn't seem to be anything wrong. Was it pallet 157? Yes, sir. Well, don't feel too guilty, Mr. Kramer. I'm sure there was nothing you could have done to save her, even if you had realized something was wrong. Uh, thank you, sir? But... What did you mean before about this not being the first sleeper to die? It happens. This is the eighth since I began overseeing the cleanup of these incidents. When it happens, we quietly remove the body, attach biodata simulators to it, and put it back in the pallet. Nobody except the caretakers involved are ever any the wiser. Then why are you telling me any of this? You have some of the highest test scores I have ever seen, despite your family history. You have some potential, if guided in the right direction. Thank you, sir. But I have to ask, shouldn't we be telling people about this? Don't they have a right to know that they're dying? That's quite enough of that kind of radical talk, Mr. Kramer. You were a farmer, you know what the sleepers mean to the lower rings. If they found out about this, it would be chaos. You are a caretaker now, Mr. Kramer. You have greater responsibilities. Yes, caretaker Kyong. What were those caretakers doing when I was coming in? Oh, they were just finishing up some unscheduled maintenance. Lucky they didn't notice anything wrong with Dr. Laura's pallet. Yeah, really lucky. Listen, Seven. We've got to do something to trick the sensors into thinking that the body we put in Dr. Laura's pallet is actually producing vital signs. Ha! Don't worry about that, miss. Uh, take a look at the monitor here. Ooh, wah. You've already taken care of it. You're smarter than I thought. Hardly. What's got you down? I don't know. Yesterday I was on the verge of fulfilling a dream my family's had for generations. But today, it's like all my beliefs are being stripped away one by one. Is there something you want to tell me? No. No, there isn't. How do I know who to trust when everybody's hiding something? Hmm? Nothing. You aren't having second thoughts about covering up Laura's awakening, are you? Because it's not just a matter of you getting in trouble with your bosses. They would bring security in, and you do not want to be in trouble with security. No, I'm not having second thoughts. Not about that. Hey, Sarah. Oh. Hello. Henry, right? Yep. Heading back to the fourth ring? Yeah, you? The same. Are you feeling better? Uh, yes I am. How did you know I wasn't well? I helped Sam get you down to the fourth ring after you collapsed. Really? Well, thank you. You still look kind of pale. Do you think you should see a caretaker? No. No, I'm fine. Just overworked myself, that's all. As long as you're sure. You know, it's funny, I've never met you before yesterday. And now I see you again. Hey, what are you doing? This is a door to the first ring. Yes, it is. Funny, there are no guards here. Uh, th there will be if we don't get moving, Sarah. If there are guards at the entrance to the third and second rings, why are there no guards here? I don't know. Aren't you curious? No, I'm not. Please, Sarah, let's go. All right. <sighs> Thank you. Come on, let's get to the third ring before anything else catches your attention. But I don't understand why there are no guards. It, it doesn't matter. 
But it doesn't make sense. There are guards everywhere else. Why not there? There don't need to be. Nobody can get in there anyway. Has anybody tried? Has anybody bothered to- Sarah! What? Please just stop talking about it. All right. Sam says I talk too much. Hey, Dr. Laura. I wasn't expecting you to be done this early. Turns out I have an unfound talent of sweeping floors. <laughs> right. Oh, make sure you have your worker ID number memorized for when we get rations later. Why? Ration allocation is based on labor hours, so you need your worker ID to authorize the release of the rations. What about people who can't work? You get used to being hungry. This is insane. Well, how did you do it? We used money. Money? Yeah, money. Currency. It's a means of exchange based on granting arbitrary value to some object, and... I suppose that sounds a bit complicated too, huh? A bit? <laughs> okay, a lot complicated. Tell me more about Earth. Earth? It's huge, and chaotic, and messy, and precious. It's just another rock in space, slowly circling an entirely unremarkable star, and yet, when you're standing on its surface, it's so much more. If it's so wonderful, why would you want to leave? Why does anybody leave home? We left to expand our horizons. We left to access new resources. We left to increase our species' chance of survival. We left to prove that we could. To grow up. Exactly. Only now I'm not sure that we'll ever get a chance to. The Soul wasn't the only ship to leave Earth. There was a whole fleet, and now the rest seem to have disappeared and nobody knows where we are or where we're going. There's only one way to find out. We have to get to the first ring. The pilot's ring. I agree. There's someone up there who knows what's going on. Someone who was able to take advantage of the damage to HM to hide the basic facts of this ship's existence from every person aboard. We need a way into the first ring. You know the structure of Soul better than anyone else. Is there a way? I don't know. When we were designing the Soul, we tried to consider every contingency. This wasn't one of them. Okay, let's start with the basics. Who comes in and out of the first ring? As far as anybody knows, the guards are the only ones who go both ways. Both ways? Sometimes people go in, but they don't come out. Once, when I first started cleaning in the second ring, I saw a man, a laborer, being taken in by security. He was never seen again. Who are the security guards? How do they fit into all of this? Well... There are ways for people to move up a ring if they score high enough on the aptitude tests. Our caretaker friend, Max the Seventh, his family are farmers, but he managed to move up a ring, probably through a combination of high test scores and favors his family has done for the caretakers, but laborers are pretty much guaranteed to never be able to advance beyond the fourth ring. Most of us don't even bother to get any education beyond the basic literacy requirements. Laborers enter the work pool young. We have to. Our families need the rations. Sometimes, if a laborer demonstrates some extraordinary talent, they're allowed to move up. That happened to my brother Rob, but it's incredibly rare. And that's the only way a laborer can move up? Well, there is one other way. What? By joining security. You don't mean that those people out there, keeping the laborers penned into the fourth ring- Yep. Almost all of them were once laborers. That's horrifying. It's the reality we have to live with. But who's in charge of the guards? The pilots? That's what I think, but since we never see the pilots, we can't really know for sure. There are stories, though. Stories? They say that the head of security is a pilot who wears armor, just like the guards, and actually comes down from the first ring disguised as an ordinary guard just to spy on us. That way, they can know firsthand what's going on in the fourth ring. That's partly why we're so careful. You never know if you're dealing with a normal guard or not. It's not like we can tell who's behind the masks. That's terrifying. They're just stories. 
Well, what about you, Sam? You're smart, really smart, and you're a natural leader. Why are you still in the fourth ring? I don't think I could do it. The fourth ring, it's, it's where my family is from. It's where my friends are. It's where I belong. I just couldn't leave it all. Let's get back to work on figuring out a plan. Okay, the obvious ways into the first ring, the anti-grav halls between it and the second ring, are probably very secure. Secure enough that they don't even bother to post guards there. If the only people who get into them are prisoners or guards, it would be pretty hard to sneak in through there. What we need is a way in that isn't obvious. That somehow is so alien to security's priorities that they don't even consider it an access point. Oh, hi, Henry. Sam, could I talk to you for a minute? Sure. In private? All right. Let's go to your pod. Bye, Sarah. Hmm. <sighs> Where does nobody bother to go? Not even security. H.M.? What can I help you with, Dr. Williams? I don't suppose you've decided to be cooperative and grant me full creator access? I am unable to do that. I thought as much. Oh well, it's not your fault, H.M. Correct, Dr. Williams. Now, was that sass or irony? Perhaps it was both. What, you don't know for sure? Humor is complex. I am an advanced computational system. You may draw your own conclusions, Dr. Williams. <laughs> that was definitely sass. Indeed, Dr. Williams. Is there anything else I can help you with? As a matter of fact, there is, HM. Do I have access to the details of the work schedules and related information? Yes. Excellent. HM, I'd like to see details on all the current engineering teams. Or to rephrase in the present vernacular, show me where the fixies are. What's bothering you, Henry? Who is she, Sam? Henry. I know all your reasons for not telling people everything. You're trying to protect us. I understand. But I still need to know, Sam. She's... Somebody who needs our help, Henry. Not only that, but she's somebody who can help us in return. Sure. Great. I accept that, but Chang, Sam, she's not normal. She's not like any caretaker or farmer I've ever met. And she's certainly no laborer. She's obviously smart, and yet there are basic things she doesn't seem to understand. And somehow, even though nobody had ever seen her before yesterday, you seem to trust her completely. Who is she? You're right, Henry. I do trust her. Partly it's out of necessity. We need her help, but it's not just that. I guess I just have a feeling about her. As for who she is, you wouldn't believe me if I told you. Try me. It's better if you don't know. Sam, I trust you more than anyone in the fourth ring, but I need to know. I won't tell anyone. You know that. I can't do that. It's not safe for you to know. It's not safe to talk about the pilots and the caretakers the way we do. I'm willing to take the risk, Sam. When did you get so brave? Following you around. <laughs> okay. You win. Her name is Dr. Laura Williams. She's a sleeper, Henry. You're right. I don't believe you. You know I wouldn't lie to you about something this important. She woke up yesterday. I don't know why exactly. Some sort of accident would be my guess, a malfunction or something. I was cleaning up there when it happened. I realized that I needed to talk to her before the caretakers got to her. She knows so much that we've all forgotten, Henry. She built soul. She designed it. Ooh, what? Uh, but Sam, this is dangerous. If security found out that we were hiding a sleeper down here, they'd cut rations again. Or worse. Can we afford to protect her? I know it's risky, but with her help we might be able to find a way into the first ring. In there, we can figure out exactly what the pilots are hiding from us. Not only that, but there's Dr. Laura's own fate to consider. What do you mean? Well, there are three things that could happen if security gets a hold of her. One, she's put back to sleep. Two, they decide she's an unacceptable risk and kill her. What? Even those jabbers wouldn't kill a sleeper. 
I wouldn't be so sure about that, but that's not even the worst possibility. The third option, and the one I would choose in their shoes, is to keep her awake and alive and use her knowledge to tighten their grip on Soul even more. Shang. So you see why we have to protect her. What was that all about? Henry had concerns about hiding you. Personally, that's not what worries me. Seven is what worries me. The caretaker who's helping us? Yeah, only I think he might be having second thoughts about that. What, do you mean he might tell someone what he did yesterday? No, I think he's smart enough to realize what security might do to him if they found out. It's just that he seemed awfully on edge earlier when we talked. Something about that conversation was... off. Maybe he's realized the implications of you waking up. Implications? People worship the Eternal Sleepers. You're the watchful guardians of soul, and you waking up kicks the whole thing right out of the proverbial airlock. I've never heard that proverb before. What? Don't you have airlocks on Earth? No, actually we don't. But Henry's right, isn't he? It would be safer for everyone in the Fourth Ring if I weren't hiding here. Maybe. But I think it could all be worth the risk if you're able to help us. I think maybe I can. Have you thought of a plan? The beginning of one, at least. Let's hear it. Well, it would never work to go in through the main connecting hallways. But you know an alternate route? Oh, I know plenty. We could try the ventilation system or the engineering access shafts. But I don't know which ones the pilots have increased security in. Agent won't let me access that information. But what HM is able to show me are all the work schedules of the lower rings. How does that help? By looking at the Fixie work schedules, I can figure out what parts of the ship they have access to. Obviously, there will still be security measures in place, but they'll be less absolute than in areas where only guards can go. Can you deal with the security measures? I've been considering that. HM is an incredibly sophisticated computer. Back on Earth, I would have sworn it was impossible to hack. Hack? Hacking is breaking into computers, and normally it's really hard. But I've been thinking. When I passed the door to the first ring earlier, I noticed something. The access panel displayed three extra levels of access codes necessary to unlock it. Makes sense. They want to be totally certain that nobody but the guards can get in. Yes, it does make sense. Perfect sense. Except I realized that all this extra security, the access codes, the issuing of full combat suits to the guards, they were programmed to only be possible if the emergency protocols were in place. But HM's basic programming allows the emergency protocols to stay in effect for only a short time, several months at most. That way the ship's officers have a chance to resolve whatever the emergency is, but can't abuse the expanded authority HM grants them in a crisis. But from what you've told me, the emergency protocols have somehow been in effect for decades at least. You said that the damage to HM allowed somebody to limit your access. Couldn't that same damage have let them change these emergency protocols? That's what I'm hoping. Wait, what? Why? Well, I'm not a programmer, but Kim taught me a lot when we were building the ship. I think I know what parts of HM were damaged. So? So, this means I know how to hack HM. I know how to get into the first ring, but there's a catch. Of course there is. We're going to need help. You know, I think it's about time Seven and I were properly introduced. <sighs> Hello there, Angela. My name's Max. I helped put you in here, but I don't know a thing about you. Yang, I'm talking to a corpse in a tank. Why am I talking to a corpse in a tank? Well, I suppose there really isn't anyone else I can talk to. Not about everything that's been going on. I wish I knew your story. It's funny to think of a laborer in here with the eternal sleepers. You'd think caretaker Kyong, or maybe the other caretakers, would have been able to see the difference. 
shouldn't there be some distinction, some way to tell the sleeper from an ordinary human being? Still, if they can die just like us, they can't be that different. How many of these cryo pallets are just holding corpses, do you think? There's not really any way to tell. My fellow caretaker's been quite thorough in hiding it. You know, as a kid, I always dreamed about being a caretaker. Everyone assumes I just wanted to jump up a ring, but that wasn't really the reason. The reason, it, it's in the name, caretaker. We care for people's bodies, we do our best to care for their souls, and we care for the eternal sleepers so that one day they might awake and care for us all. <laughs> I really believed that. I always believed that. Even after I panicked and helped a laborer profane a cryo pallet, I still believed. But now, after watching somebody, a caretaker, lift a corpse out of that very same pallet as if it were nothing out of the ordinary, I just don't know what I believe anymore. Soul, I wish I were still a farmer. Hey there, Seven. Yang! Sorry to startle you. Uh, how long were you standing there? We just got here. Why? Were you talking to yourself? What? No. Well, not exactly. <laughs> You want to watch out for that. The first sign of madness, they say. Huh. Questioning my own sanity is the last thing I need right now. I'm sure you remember Dr. Laura Williams? Oh my, I'm sorry I didn't see you there, Doctor. That's alright. It's good to meet you, Seven. Seriously? You told her my name is Seven? It's a good name! What are you two even doing up here? Isn't it risky for you to be up here if it's not your work shift? Maybe, but we can handle it. Okay, but why are you even here? We need your help. You see, we're planning to sneak into the first ring. What? Shh. Not so loud. Are you two crazy? Why would you want to go in there? We have too many questions for the pilots for us not to go. Well, what do you need me for? Caretakers can't get into the pilot's ring any more than laborers can. Maybe that's just what they want you to think. What? I have a plan to get us into the first ring. For it to work, we have to trick the computer into thinking that there's a medical emergency. And to do that, we need an accredited medical officer. What? We need a caretaker. We need you, Seven. Think about it. The proactive approach may be the best way to keep your involvement in Dr. Laura's awakening secret. I don't care about that. I'm tired of all these secrets. If you're tired of secrets, then help us. I don't know. How else are you going to find out the truth? You're right. This is the only way. I'll do it. I'll help you get into the first ring. To be continued. Episode 2, A Web of Secrets. Written by Laura Munger, directed by Julia Rutledge. Sam Finley is played by Lauren Odie. Dr. Laura Williams is played by Aubrey Dangel. Maximilian Kramer VII is played by Mitchell Parker. H.M. is played by Wyatt Chapman. Henry is played by Trent Browning. Caretaker Kyong is played by Walter Lutch. The first caretaker was played by Julia Rutledge. The second caretaker was played by Shelley Ewell. And the guard was played by Adam Kane. Lost Souls is executive produced by Callan Gustafson. We've come to the end of another episode of Viking Radio Theater. We'll resume airing in spring quarter, but remember, you can always catch up on all of our episodes on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash vikingradiotheater. The writers who contributed to this episode were Matthew Page, Laura Munger, and Adam Kane. Our chief sound engineer is Blair Lorenzo, and Viking Radio Theater's theme music was written and composed by Kat Miller. From the cast and crew of Viking Radio Theater, thanks for listening.